This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Liam, for the instruction, and also thank you, uh, everybody, for coming to my talk. So here's the title of my talk, Understanding the Molecular Mechanisms Underlying Aluminum Resistance in Plants. Uh, so my topic is about aluminum toxicity. Aluminum toxicity is tightly associated with acid soil. The reason is that aluminum is the most abundant metals on the earth crust. Under neutral pH, aluminum is tightly bound to the soil clays, which is not toxic to plant. However, under acid soil condition, the toxic aluminum species, so that's Al3+, plus, is, will release from the soil clay into soil solution, which is highly toxic to plant uh, root growth. Here shows the map of wood acid soils. So you can see the acid soil, which is in red color, is widely distributed around the world with a significant fraction in the de uh, developing countries, in the tropics and subtropics. So there is really a need to understand the molecular mechanisms underlying, or mechanisms underlying aluminum resistance in crops in order to further enhance resistance to acid soil for crops. So this slide shows the toxic effects of aluminum on two wheat lines. So one is uh, ETA, that's aluminum tolerant, and ESA is aluminum sensitive. As you can see, under neutral pH, there's no difference uh, in root growth between these two lines. However, under acid soil condition, you can see this sensitive line, the root growth was completely inhibited with stunted and damaged root growth. So the problem of aluminum toxicity is so privileged in developing country. So it is the major limitation for crop, crop production on acid soil. So also from this slide, you can see uh, the genetic variation in terms of aluminum resistance. So this is the uh, focus for our study. And this is also the uh, basis for plant breeding purposes. So in today's talk, I will first briefly introduce the strategies adopted by plants to cope with aluminum stress. And then I will highlight some efforts in my group to unveil how plants use these strategies to achieve aluminum resistance. Uh, Okay, so here's the diagram of a plant. So this is the root <coughs> and the above ground uh, part. And this part is a um, magnification of the root, especially the root tip region. So root tip is the target for aluminum toxicity. So it's most sensitive to aluminum stress. So here's the uh, rhizosphere, and here's a diagram for the uh, root epidermal cells with a plasma membrane, the membrane of vacuole, and a cell wall. So the widely and most uh, uh, documented mechanisms for aluminum resistance is the exclusion or avoidance, avoidance mechanisms, which prevents aluminum from getting into uh, the root cells. So this is done by uh, the release of the uh, root cells of uh, organic acids such as malate, citrates, into the uh, rhizospheres where the organic acid can form non-toxic uh, OA aluminum complex that cannot be get into the cell, so it's like exclusion. So that's the first mechanism. The second mechanism, oh, uh, the second mechanism to deal with the aluminum that enters into uh, the root cells. So this aluminum can be either sequestered into the vacuole 
or can be translocated from the root to the shoot. So the shoot is less sensitive to aluminum stress. So recently, increasing lines of evidence indicate that modification of cell wall structure and function could be a uh, critical uh, step for aluminum resistance in plants. So I also focus on that in my later talk. So here comes the second part of my talk. So I will uh, highlight some efforts <coughs> in my group for, uh, for the uh, alumina exclusion mechanisms in sorghum and uh, true aluminum resistance uh, in apodopsis. And finally, I will uh, report on some of our progress in understanding the regulatory or signaling pathway involving resistance to low pH and aluminum stress in Arabidopsis. So here comes the first part. So this shows uh, the root growth of two sorghum lines. One is tolerant SC283 and the sensitive BR007 on the uh, low pH plus aluminum solution. So you can see the root growth of the tolerant lines has no effect, but you can see stunted and damaged root for the sensitive lines. And th this is the work done by Jura uh, McGahays. So he's a former PhD student uh, for Liang, and um, now he's a close collaborator for, for our, our group also. So also he found that the, um, the very close correlation between the uh, aluminum activated citrate release from the torrent line and aluminum resistance. So there's no uh, organic acid release from the sensitive line versus the, uh, the torrent line, and this line is very sensitive sensitive. So here the summary for the relationship between uh, aluminum tolerance and uh, root citrate release. So here shows the, uh, the tolerant line growth uh, with or without aluminum. So this is the control and the treatment in a period of uh, six days aluminum treatment. So you can see the first day uh, the root growth of even for the root growth of the tolerant line, so it was uh, inhibited by about 50% compared to the uh, control. So it continued uh, being inhibited at that level. But on uh, the third day of treatment, you can see uh, gradually uh, increase of root growth. And by the fourth day, you see there's no difference between uh, the treatment and the control. And this process is a very closely and positively correlated with the root uh, citrate release in the tolerant line. So you see, uh, without aluminum, you don't see any citrate release. But with aluminum, so the, uh, you can see gradually induction of citrate release. So by the, I mean the third day, uh, there's much more citrate release, and then this corresponds to the increase of root growth so by the time of the sixth day, uh, the huge amount of uh, citrate release from the root tip, and you can see full recovery of the root growth in the torrent line. In contrast, in the sensitive line, you never see any uh, citrate release from the root with or without aluminum. And actually, the uh, root growth never recover from the treatment. And based on that, uh, Jura, he did a uh, QTR mapping project, and he actually um, mapped the aluminum resistant locus into one single bag. So then I uh, come into Leon's lab and Ju Jura graduate, and uh, so we further uh, collab on collaborate on that project. And also, by the way, I mean, uh, he also did the uh, correlation analysis for uh, citrate release and aluminum tolerance for a 
small panel of sorghum. So there's 10 a section. What he found is the citrate release is positively correlated with uh, aluminum tolerance among the, uh, this a section. And also, so we finally cloned the, the gene, the resistant gene. It encodes a sorghum, a, a member of sorghum, matojog, and toxic compound extrusion. So gene, so we demonstrate that, uh, so this SB mate gene actually encode the aluminum activated C trait transporter in, uh, in sorghum. And the expression of SB mate is positively correlated with aluminum tolerance as well as C trait release in the same uh, sorghum accession panel I mentioned in the previous slide. So here comes the problem. So what is the trade-off for using C-trade as a weapon for aluminum resistance? It's very obvious that that's a carbon cost. So, uh, so for plants, best benefit is to use minimum amount of C-trade uh, to achieve maximum um, uh, aluminum tolerance. So that's deal with the carbon use efficiency. Uh, so how can sorghum <coughs> achieve this? The one way is to uh, specify the expression of SB mate gene expression. So we can see uh, SB mate is only is made expressed in the root tip region. So that's the the region most sensitive to aluminum, and that's the one that need most protection. And not only that, I mean, if you uh, we also do the um, immunolocalization and the LCM, the laser uh, dissection microscope, uh, real-time PCR. Actually, the SB made protein and uh, transcription is only expressed in the very defined region, like uh, epidermal cells and the first layer of uh, cortex. So that's defined the citrate release only in that part of the plant uh, root tissue. So is that enough? So the uh, question is not. The reason is that the acid soil is on, uh, in reality is not a uh, homogeneous yeah, property. Actually, it's quite heterogeneous uh, in distribution. So here shows a, an acid soil uh, field in Australia. So the red color indicate that uh, the soil is highly acidic. But you see, not far away. I mean, there's some uh, some soil region that's high, either neutral or even alkaline. So, so that's in the x y dimension. But if you look at the the third dimension, the ver vertical dimension, so you can see also very a uh, lot of variation. You, usually, I mean, the top soils are less aluminum uh, toxicity than the deep soil. Uh, deep soil. And also, when the plants grow from the top soil into the deep soil, so, so plants roots uh, grow as a tip growth uh, manner. So whenever he goes, it's like constantly meet uh, the change of soil environment. So the question is, how do plant roots sense the frequent uh, changes in aluminum toxicity? and how it react. So that's the uh, question we want to address. And so to answer this question in, in Sorghum, I actually um, transformed the SB May gene into yeast. Yeast has no homolog uh, of SB May gene in its genome. So without aluminum, you see no uh, with or without aluminum, you see no uh, citrate release, which is mediated by the SB mate. But with the SB mate expression, is you can see the uh, constitutive is, uh, release of citrate with or without aluminum. So this is a very different from what we have seen in uh, sorghum. So which uh, so the 
sick tray release is actually activated, only activated by a luminous jet. So no release uh, under control. So this suggests there must have some uh, negative regulator for SB made uh, in plants. So that's lead to uh, led to uh, my second uh, work here. So so I think, and then I decided to use the split ubiquitin is two hybrid systems. So beca because I use that. Uh, because SB mate is a membrane protein, so I have to use this ubiquitin system, uh, is two hybrid system, to screen um, a library that made from the source organ root tip. And I found a very strong candidate uh, interacting protein. So it's a putative metal binding protein. So here we call it uh, as MBP as a strong candidate for the uh, SB mate interacting component. So what happened if we co-transform uh, these two components into yeast? Actually, we see the uh, reconstitution of aluminum activated citrate release as we've seen uh, in sorghum. So here is the single SB mate uh, trans transformed. And you see constitutionally large amount of citrate release was the uh, very controlled and alumina activated citrate release in the uh, double transformant. So the question is, uh, the citrate is the, I mean, um, organic acid that binds to alumina. So it's a foundation for alumina resistance. So what, what's the, uh, Aluminum tolerance of these two lines, with this one has higher amount of citrate release, can achieve higher degree of aluminum resistance or not. So here is the next experiment for uh, testing uh, relative growth or aluminum tolerance for three different east lines. So it's the uh, east just transformed with empty vector, so you see that's very sensitive to aluminum. But the uh, single transform, the, uh, the growth geometry increase, but it's not as good as the uh, double transform. So we may remember, I mean, this line has huge amount of citrate release. So we thought, oh, it could be re reach a higher degree of aluminum resistance, but actually it's not. The reason is that the carbon cost that's too much, and then actually inhibit uh, cell growth. Oh, very sensitive. So here comes uh, the wor working model for how these two components work together to achieve aluminum activated uh, citrate exudation. So here is the plasma membrane of the root epidermal cells, and SBMA is a uh, citrate transporter and MBP is a negative regulator for SB mate. So without aluminum, it tightly binds to the uh, permeation pathway of uh, the citrate transporter, so which can block the citrate release from cell, uh, the cytosol into uh, rhizosphere. And MBP is a aluminum binding protein. Under acidic soil condition, you, uh, MBP binds to aluminum and change its uh, conformation and also its affinity to um, SBMA will be decreased. And this will lead to uh, dissociation or partial dissociation of MBP from the SBMA, so leading to opening of the citrate exudation uh, perme permeation pathway, so leading to the exudation of um, Citrate release. Okay, so so next would be to uh, to adjust this model. We need to confirm uh, yeah three things. One is MBP is an aluminum binding protein, and also the binding to aluminum can disrupt the uh, MBP and SB mate interaction. So here's the work by uh, Michael Lee. Uh, so I think he's also in the audience. And so here's the pour-down assay. 
to demonstrate that uh, MBP is a pH-dependent aluminum binding protein. So here is just the beads. You see there's no uh, binding of aluminum to, uh, to uh, binding of the MBP to the beads. So that means any binding here is specific. And also uh, under uh, the treatment, we only see the binding of MBP to um, aluminum, the aluminum beads at the low pH, but not in the neutral pH. So that's uh, confirmed that MBP is a pH dependent uh, aluminum binding protein. And second, we need to demonstrate that uh, aluminum binding to MBP can disrupt uh, MBP and SB mate interaction. So here is the in vitro pull down assay. So you can see under the neutral pH, so it with, uh, with the in presence or in absence of aluminum, so there's always strong interaction between SB mate and um, SB MBP here, right? However, under low pH, without aluminum, we can see a little bit decrease of uh, interaction of these two components. But when aluminum was added, you see there's no interaction. That means that's completely dissociated within these two, uh, uh, two components. So that's in vivo. And then I did uh, the in vivo BIFC uh, interaction. So that's a system that tested for interaction of two uh, proteins. If there's protein-protein interaction, you will see fluorescent. And if the interaction was disrupted, you will see decrease of the uh, fluorescent signal. So, so that's the uh, BIFC. And then uh, this movie shows uh, what happened after aluminum was added. So this is the uh, tobacco epidermal leaf cell. Yeah, I mean, it's quite rapid process. It's about two and a half hours. You see almost completely dis uh, disappearance of the uh, fluorescent. So OK, what's the uh, control? So this is a control that just um, eject the buffer, but without aluminum, and with the same period time of recording. Yeah, see the difference. So, uh, so that demonstrates that uh, <coughs> the interaction of uh, aluminum, I mean, uh, SB made MBP was disrupted by adding aluminum. So, so in previous slide, we demonstrate that MBP is a uh, aluminum binding protein, and binding of aluminum could cause dissociation of MBP and SB mate interaction. So pretty much demons uh, confirm our hypothesis. Oh. So here comes the, uh, the second of part. So it's dealing with the true tolerance in albidopsics. So, so it's uh, this part. So deal with the uh, remove aluminum from cell wall into cytosol. So cell wall is a very important organelle for uh, in uh, in aluminum tolerance. So it's estimated that ninety percent of the aluminum in roots was accumulated in cell wall. So increasing number of uh, increasing uh, number lines of Evidence indicate that modification of cell wall components could be a very important, uh, plays a very important role in aluminum resistance. So um, the true tolerance 
magnesons involved like uh, two parts. One is move aluminum into the um, cytosol followed by uh, sequester sequestration into the vacuole or, or translocate into uh, the above ground tissues. So in fact, in, in plants, there's a specific class of um, uh, that actually they like aluminum. So this is the so-called aluminum accumulated plant species. So including like uh, tea, buckwheat, and hydrangea. So they tend to uptake large amount of aluminum from the soil and um, translocate it into the uh, shoot tissue and store the aluminum in the vacuola. So, so this photo shows um, hydrangea plants in, a, uh, in front of Wagamans in the next early <laughs> spring, yeah. So you can see there, um, they some of them produce uh, blue flowers with some uh, sometimes red flowers. But I can tell you, they all have the same genetics. So that means the flower ch uh, color change is due to environment, environmental effects, but not genetic effects. Actually, it's, uh, it's on the uh, assisting of soil. So the, the one on the left that's grew in the uh, acid soil, so that produced uh, the blue flower was the neutral pH uh, soil you see that uh, produced red flower. So, so here's a close up for the, <laughs> very beautiful I think, yeah. And actually, the only difference, uh, there's a, a group in Japan, they are, they are horticulture, they actually analyzed uh, what's going on here. They found that actually <coughs> the uh, only difference for, for the, these two flowers is that uh, this one, the, the, the blue one, they accumulate high amount of aluminum in the uh, sepal. I mean, what we see actually is the sepal is not pattern. It was the, uh, the, the, the the red red color flower, and then actually they um, the reason is that uh, under neutral pH, so this the uh, anthocyanin accumulated in the vacuole, so called uh, they are finding three O glucoside, so it has a native red color, but under soil uh, as acidic soil condition aluminum would be accumulated into the uh, vacuole, which combines to the uh, anthocyanin and turn its color into blue. That's the uh, secret of that magic. And actually, <laughs> they clone these two uh, transporter. So one is responsible for the uh, moving of aluminum into the cytosol, so that's plasma membrane localized, they call it, um, part or plasma membrane localized aluminum transporter. And the, the one responsible for um, vacuola transporter is uh, called Watt or vacuola aluminum transporter. Both these genes are belong to um, the acoporin gene family. So acoporin, it's a very large uh, gene family in plants, so like they have 35 members in Apidopsis and 33 in rice. And also, acoporin tend to transport uh, neutral solid. Um, because, and also, I mean, uh, port and ward are the first members of acoporin demonstrate that um, be able to transport aluminum. So that's the uh, quite interesting for us uh, working on aluminum uh, resistance. So the question, although they demonstrate that uh, these genes function in aluminum transporter, but they, we don't know if they have any function in aluminum tolerance in plant. And because the part is the plasma membrane localized uh, aluminum transporter, and which is, could be a critical component for 
uh, aluminum uptake in, uh, in roots. So I, we decided to focus uh, to study the, the port homolog in Arabidopsis. And HM port is closely related to the NIP subfamily in, uh, in Arabidopsis. NIP stands for the nurturing 26 intrinsic protein. So this uh, work was done, lead led by Yichi Wang. And also, we screened the library uh, for the uh, nine member of the NIP, NIPs in Apidopsis and found out that uh, NIP 1-2 actually has the uh, hypersensitive phenotype uh, to aluminum stress when <coughs> expressed in yeast. So here's the uh, control and the treatment. And also we, include, uh, we included NRAD1, so it's a famous uh, aluminum transporter uh, <coughs> localized in the root cell plasma <coughs> membrane. So this work is uh, being done by uh, Jian Yong's and Li Yang's group. And we can see hypersensitive of uh, NIP1-2 to aluminum, but it's the sensitivity is not as strong as um, the NRAD1 indicated that probably, I mean, the NIP1-2, the capacity is lower than uh, NRAD1 in terms of aluminum transport. And also, each test the aluminum accumulation in the three east line, we can see um, the hyper accumulation of aluminum in the uh, NIP1-2 expression east line, but the amount is not as high as uh, the Android one, further indicating that the capacity of NIP1-2 transporter, aluminum transporter, might be it's lower than Android one. Also, uh, each test the subcellular localization of NIP1-2, he made uh, the GFP fusion protein, and this slide shows the uh, localization of the fusion protein, so it's in the plasma membrane, and this further demonstrated by the uh, dipi stain, so it's very clear localized on the plasma membrane for this protein. And NIP1-2 is only made express on the root, but not in shoe. So that's the uh, RT-PCR. And also this is the real-time PCR. And see the induction of NIP1-2 expression by aluminum. So after four hours of aluminum treatment, so it reached the maximum level and uh, decreased a little bit. And also NIP1-2 expression is specifically induced by aluminum treatment, but not by other metal uh, stress, as well as by the low uh, pH treatment. So here's the uh, tissue-specific localization of uh, NIP1-2. So this is the gas uh, analysis. So you can see uh, NIP1-2 is mainly expressed in the root tip region of uh, the, main, the primary and lateral root. And so also the, you see the gas staining was enhanced by aluminum treatment. So you can see the, uh, not only enhanced also by the region, I mean, going up and down. So what's the phenotype for, for the NIP1-2 mutant in, uh, in terms of aluminum uh, tolerance? So here shows that the NIP1-2, so we acquire three independent tDNA insertion line from ABRC, and can see uh, all of them are hypersensitive to, uh, to aluminum treatment compared to the wild type. So here's the wild type, and uh, the significant decrease of uh, the root growth for uh, two representative line. And so we try to understand the mechanisms why NIP1-2 is 
can uh, and, uh, it's a function in aluminum tolerance. So one thing is that we uh, measure, I mean, stain uh, the wild type and NIP1-2 mutant with uh, hematoxylene. So this is the dye that stained aluminum in the cell wall, only in the cell wall, but not in the cytosol. Well, we can see there's almost no staining without aluminum, but strong staining in the root uh, tip region for the wild type. But the, uh, the strength of the stain is much um, higher in the uh, mutant line. So that suggests there's more aluminum was accumulated in the mutant than the wild type. So here is the quantification for this uh, experiment. We see uh, compared to the wild type and the mutant, uh, the mutant tends to accumulate more aluminum in the side as, uh, cell wall. But in the cytosol, it is reverse. I mean, we see less aluminum was transported into the um, cytosol. That suggests, I mean, uh, NIP1-2 is a aluminum transporter responsible for uh, uptake of aluminum into the cytosol. Uh, so here's the working model for, uh, for this part. Yeah, so the N NIP 1-2 responsible for aluminum uptake from cell wall or from the um, uh, rhizosphere and then move to, uh, to the pericycle through the same plastic flow. So we don't know if N uh, NIP 1-2 is also responsible for the silent uptake, or it could, but it could have some other components. But definitely, it, it's uh, involved in the aluminum translocation from root to shoe. I didn't show the slide. I mean, we, we found that actually the uh, aluminum content in the shoe for the um, mutant is less than than the in the, the, the wild wild type. Yeah. So this slide summarized. Alabdopsis aluminum tolerance. Actually, Alabdopsis has adopted the exclusion mechanism, so that's involved the release of malate C chain, and also we demonstrate that uh, the true tolerance mechanisms also function in Alabdopsis. And also um, in Xiao Zhenzhen's group in Zhejiang University, they have done a lot of work on the cell wall part. So, so it's a Small plant, it's not very tolerant to uh, aluminum, but it has almost every no mechanisms for aluminum resistance. Okay, the last part, uh, I will briefly report on our recent progress in dissecting regulatory pathways uh, involved in resistance to low pH and aluminum stress in Arabidopsis. So in Arabidopsis, in Kayama's group, they identify a uh, mutant that are highly uh, sensitive to low pH. So only to low, uh, low pH, they, that's th what they screen uh, for. And they, they clone this gene, uh, it, it, they call the stop one. It encodes a single finger transcription factor. Actually, it's a master transcription factor that control many of uh, the now very, very now aluminum resistant gene like uh, AT-AMT1, that's a melee transporter, and AT-MATE is a citrate transporter, and AL3 also very important, but we don't know exactly how it functions. So probably it's function in the junction of aluminum tolerance and phospho uh, deficiency yeah, resistance. So it's a master uh, signal uh, transcription fact factor. So in this part, is, this work is led by Fei Jiang, who is a uh, two-year visiting uh, graduate student. I mean, it's very amazing, as you, he, as you can see uh, in later, so has made a lot of progress. So the, this is the uh, diagram, the possible signaling pathway for, uh, for the stop one controlled uh, system. So we, we know stop one, if you knock it out, it's hypersensitive to low pH, but also all these genes are, are not done, knockout and 
and it's also hypersensitive, hi hypersensitive to aluminum uh, toxicity. But we know these two processes are independent. The reason is that uh, all of these mutants, they are not hypersensitive to low pH, so they are separate. So and in this world, we try to find uh, the, some component in any of this uh, pathway. So we're using traditional um, uh, classic genetics to screen revertence for the, uh, S, the stop one uh, phenotype, phenotype. So here the result, I mean this wild type and the low pH and uh, the stop one mutants are hypersensitive to, to, to low pH. And this the stop one revert, and you see uh, it's not completely revertent, but it says 80% or 70% are, are revertent in terms of root growth. And here's some of the uh, putative mutant uh, for the revertent. And then we try to test their response to different uh, stress. One, uh, like aluminum, you see some of the reverton, it's actually, it's more resistant to, uh, to aluminum compared to the, uh, its parent line. And some of them is hypersensitive to sodium, and resistant to ca cadmium compared to the, even to the wild type. But some of them are very sensitive to Cadmium. So they are, we don't know what, what's going on now. And then uh, Fei Jiang decided to uh, clone one of these genes with the uh, next gen sequencing approaches. So this is the, the revertent, so, and then cross with the stop one mutant. And in, in the F2 population, so pull the long root with the uh, short root, and extract DNA, make a library sequencing uh, next gen sequencing and can find a uh, putative SNP to uh, associate with the different phenotype. And the last step would be uh, verify, verify the, uh, if that's really the causative SNP. So here's the, the, the result, the wild type and uh, the hypersensitive of stop one and root growth at the low pH. And this is the, uh, the revertent. So, and so we know this gene, and then we can uh, order uh, the tDNA insertion line on this, uh, for this gene. And actually, uh, the tDNA, it's not sensitive to, um, to low pH stress. So what if we incorporate the tDNA, the this mutant, into the uh, stop one background? Could we see any revertent phenotype as the uh, the EMS mu mu mutant mutation? Yeah, actually it is. I mean, there's almost no difference between uh, the EMS generated mutant and the tDNA uh, insertion mutant in the stop one background. So pretty much we think we we uh, uh, find out this gene. <coughs> and finally, that's uh, the last slide, and I. Would like to first thank Leah. Yeah, that's. I mean, I can express more my uh, appreciation for him. So first, uh, I worked with him as a postdoc, as he uh, mentioned, and also he hired me as a uh, SY and work on this project. I mean, we have ten years work uh, experience. But I'm sorry he's leaving. But I think we are, are still. Uh, Collaborate. I mean, close uh, collaborate in the fu future. And here's the work. I mean, uh, the the <coughs> member in the group that work uh, in, in this project. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, present all of their work. And also Jiang and Arif. Uh, his um, and also thanks for the collaborator and the fund funding agency. Uh, and and also, uh, I can. So this is the Michael. He worked for the uh, most of the protein part of work, and Yu Qi. Uh, he led the uh, NIP one dash two project, and Fei Jiang. He's a uh, two year visiting uh, graduate student from Chinese Academy of Science. So so he's leaving. I mean, in the summer, but he led the. Uh, 
the stop one reverting project. So it's very amazing. Yeah, the only two years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. So I would like to answer questions. <laughs> Is there uh, any indication that, uh, that uh, there's any sort of signal from the chute coming back down to the river? Uh, that's a tough question, yeah. We, we haven't looked that yet. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't know that, yeah. Yeah, it could be, but mainly, I mean, the, uh, the toxicity of aluminum is maybe target at the uh, root, root region. Right? Actually, shield is much, much less sensitive to to aluminous jets. And uh, some, I, I know some of the plant species like uh, the aluminum accumulate, like tea, like uh, buckwheat. They actually like uh, acid soil. Yeah, they grew better in in the acid soil environment. What they did is like uh, uptake large amount of aluminum uh, from the soil and then translocate it into the shoe, like uh, the vacuum of, of shoe tissues. So I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know how this shoe signal can coming back to, <laughs> yeah, probably more important for, for the root uh, than shoe. Yeah. Knowing your, your field of research, um, thinking not just signal, but photosynthate for the citrate you know, organic acid releasing, we've always wondered if, you know, do you get more photosynthate going to those roots? I think we can finally look at that um, through, and where I'm going, they have a, or we can see 11 label plants and they have a positron emission tomography so we can image the carbon coming photosynthetic going to the roots at the same time we can image, you know, the roots and challenge them with aluminum and see if that, or say just a specific root, see if that change, if that change, if you see, because I've always wondered is that going to turn on, I don't want a single, but photosynthetic coming down there, so, because you are losing, although the plant, as he said, Minimize how much it loses by having just that little area. So, but it's something we're going to be able to look at. When move. But how much is it? I mean, what 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 amount of carbon is being exported into the soil? Do you have any idea? Um, so we haven't. I don't know if you have any quantification, but uh, actually it, we we saw indirectly. Yeah, uh, the carbon loss actually uh, affect root growth. Yeah, because we have the overexpression line for the uh, melee or citrate release, and without aluminum, so the growth uh, actually is not as good as the uh, non transgenic line suggests. <laughs> uh, it has some negative, yeah, definitely has some negative impact on the root growth. So. And it probably varies from species to species. The sorghum seems to be really localized. Rabbitops seems to be more spread out, so I do something like Rabbitops is really overexpresses these transporters without aluminum, they still release a moderate amount. Yeah. They don't grow as well. Well, it's going to depend on the sink strain. Yeah, all, all that right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So a lot of stuff that, you, know. you know, I think the sense. biggest, the most dramatic, I don't mean to, you know, <laughs> example of this, though, is the <laughs> lupins <laughs> under oh, the yeah, efficiency yeah. In, the, in the hairy roots. They can release 30% of the carbon yeah. citrate, but that's yeah. not a crop plant, though. You know, it's, a, it's just surviving. So, okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> Oh, yeah. back, back it's not a silly question, but does the when a plant grows in acidic conditions, does the pH of the epidermal cells in the root change? Does it drop? Epidermal? You mean the? Oh yeah, I mean the morphology. There's lots of morphological change. Not the morphology, but the pH. Does the it? PH, the pH. Like pH when you're releasing the citrate. Citrate. Yeah, I mean that's that's a tough question. So we're really wondering what what's the pH, what's the form of aluminum being transported. Uh, from soya to uh, cytosol, uh, definitely the aluminum effect has to be uh, at the low pH. Uh, but we don't know, I mean, the, probably the micro environment could be very different. So yeah, as to um, the epidermal cells. So it seems like the interface of the membrane would have to be acidified for the effect to happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, think about your acid chemistry. <laughs> You got that citrate sitting at pH 7.4 cytosol. So it's actually being released as the lowest base. Well, so now it, on the outside. That but once outside. it comes out, it's, if anything, it's going to bind protons. Right? Yeah. yeah so this is something I yelled at Marshner about in his text. Actually, I have a book, uh, an autograph from Leon. Remember, now, 
none of us are right off the time or something like that. Because he says sit, organic acid release acidifies, and it doesn't. Because you're not releasing the acid, you're releasing the base. It's already lost its protons in the cytoplasm. So, so if anything, it might raise it. So by releasing the protons in the cytoplasm, it's, it acidifies the, that region of the cytoplasm, you think? But some some plants seem to prefer a set of pH, like blueberries. Um, do you think they use the same mechanisms? Ah, uh, you mean the blueberry for they prefer low low pH? Oh, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Could be. I mean, some of the um. Yeah, aluminum could have some beneficial effect. I, I read some paper, but yeah. yeah. T too. T. T, yeah, T. Yeah, that's also, I, I read a paper that the uh, aluminum accumulation in tea is mostly in the old V. So you buy tea by good quality. Yeah, yeah but yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> well, That might explain some of the behavior of the British. <laughs> 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 that actually was a concern at that point. Yeah, there was a health scare about that. Right. Tea, tea uh, sales dropped dramatically for a while. So, no, a lot of the tea in China, like growing around the Zhejiang University, that's an acid. That I said, yeah, tea prefer yeah. acid soya. Yeah. Yeah. Only as well, soya. But that's the green tea, so it's the fresh, the young leaves, the green tea? Yeah, yeah I mean, the younger leaves, they actually they, so less uh, have less of movement. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.